Do you remember a couple of months ago when I released the hex scatter tool for Blender, a collection of node groups designed to help you turn non-seamless textures into lovely, completely seamless materials with a variety of complex blending methods, effectively what we call semi-procedural techniques, to help you get both stylized and realistic materials from like very small and easy to make input samples. Well, shortly after releasing that video, I got a few comments on that one saying, oh, that looks cool, but why don't you use it on a more complex object? I think the insinuation was, are you hiding something by not using this material on anything other than a sphere? No, I've been moving house. Like, <laughs> bitch, I've been busy. Uh, so here you go, on the screen. Ta-da! It took no time at all. I just, I've downloaded a Quixel scan. By the way, you can claim every free Quixel scan on the website before it goes offline. I don't know if you know about this, but Epic Games is changing a whole bunch of services and bringing them under like a new umbrella called Fab. They haven't sponsored me, so I'm not going to talk more about it. But if you want to claim a bunch of like free models and stuff, you can go and do that. But no, today I finally remembered to play with Hex Scatter again, downloaded a bust object and then Voila! I mean, the one on the left is using hex scatter, and the one on the right is just pure base color. So you can see it's a very highly detailed uh, mesh in terms of geometry. But with hex scatter, we're getting the fingerprint textures, and this is the default texture that comes in the hex scatter package. Just to show you, for full transparency, it's using the preamble TP hex splat node group, and that is plugged in. As you can see here, I'm adding brown for a mixed color node. Um, you don't even need these nodes here. This is just for optional ambient occlusion darkening. So the color would go into the principal BSDF, and that's it really. So if you were wondering what our new complex solution to seamless materials looks like on a complex object, that's what it looks like. No hiding, no trickery, that's that's just what it is. But it's always funny when we release techniques. I think there's always like some skeptical minds going on, trying to see the worst in everything. So let's zoom in, have a little look around. One thing I will say is that for this specific mesh, I have the displacement disabled. You'll see here the scale is set to zero. And that's because since this is a raw scan mesh, it's got a lot of like these really sharp depressions and cavities as part of that process of actually uh, bringing the mesh into a 3D object. Uh, what that means is displacement gets a little bit funky for things like this. So if I increase that, you'll be able to see what happens. I mean, that's a strong value anyway, far too strong for this mesh. Uh, but if it was retopologized, and then if things were a lot more balanced, then that would be perfectly fine. I can actually demonstrate that for you as well. Hang on. So if I hide these two and get a retopoed version. So this is a smoother version of the object with reconstructed geometry. If I then slightly increase the displacement of this, that's too far. I'm holding shift, by the way. So let's do 1.5, 0 0.015. Then we can see the displacement happening from the material and I have adaptive subdivision enabled obviously the quality of the adaptive displacement depends on your subdivision values and dicing scale so for a little bit of background why am I so obsessed with the idea of procedural clay a lot of people have done their own versions of clay clay is one thing I wanted to make a long time ago now I was obsessed with this idea of like semi-procedural scattering because I knew that there would be so many different possibilities like really endless possibilities swapping back to the high quality mesh so one thing I did back in my old bedroom was I got a bunch of clay I wetted it and then just destroyed destroyed it in different ways, then took pictures of it, and then imported those image pictures to be fed into a Voronoi scattering node. But it was just too restrictive in terms of like mapping techniques. In particular, there was one problem we had where when applying random rotations, which we have working perfectly well here, the mapping would break. But our solution, created by Chris, is perfect. We can do random scales and rotations. It's maybe a bit difficult to see here with all the denoising, but everything just works. The most impressive thing that people clocked onto was the height blending method we used to kind of blend data between neighboring cells of the scattered images. So now I've turned down the height blending. Let's see. There we go. So this is a triplanar cell. If I increase the height blending here, you see a blur and then just disappear. And there's another one here as well. So this is from a regular cell, not a triplanar cell. But if we increase the blending of that, it disappears. We can just make any issue gone. If you're wondering about the lighting, by the way, again, my Afterglow product. If you don't like advertisements for my products, then I'm sorry, but this is what I do. I make products. If you're new here, I make resources and stuff for Blender. Not everything is paid, by the way. I have a variety of free resources if you want to take a look. Have a little cycle back through my Gumroad and YouTube videos and you'll find stuff there and on my website, codisol.online slash door. So where do we go from here? Well, the reason I didn't make that clay product in the end was because I was disappointed with old fashioned Voronoi techniques. I felt like we needed to come up with a better way of scattering to actually make a valuable material product in the end. So that material product never got made. We've made 
Tech Scatter, which is fantastic. That's the foundation technology. This is perhaps the first material of this hypothetical pack now. An updated clay with perfectly functional projection and random variety for the cells. Let's play around. I love proceduralism. We can make like any color clay we like. We can feed in different factors like ambient occlusion and edge wear and stuff like that. It's really opening like a whole new world for creative stylization. I wonder if I can modify this into some kind of like faience like material. So slightly lower roughness, maybe. I shouldn't get too distracted. It happens all the time. I start playing with something and then I just end up somewhere completely different. Ah, sod it. Let's do it. I want to add some gold to this bust. Why not? I made a promise to myself recently that I would have more fun with making YouTube videos and just not care about views and statistics and all that. And it comes after a revelation that I kind of discovered when looking back through data about my presence online. And oh, I'm just noticing I need to link up my procedural patterns pack back up to this. Yeah, I kind of looked back through data recently and realized that really optimizing YouTube for a high view count doesn't make any difference like it doesn't make any difference to me whatsoever so why would i do it so what i'm doing now is i have a pack of procedural patterns that i've just briefly linked up to my asset library in the user settings and i kind of want to do almost like a kintsugi type thing with gold stripes going across it just off the top of my head so this isn't a beginner tutorial i'm just gonna have fun with it because this is the stuff i like doing let's do a mix shader because we'll have all kind of base clay like material and then something a little bit metallic one thing i should be careful of is the node limit so our node groups for the hex splatting are pretty close to the circle's node limit, but I've heard on the grapevine that that may not be the case forever. I wouldn't say for long because I don't know when it's coming out, but there are people in the community working on image input sockets for the shader editor, which will drastically reduce the number of nodes that hex scatter uses. Okay, let's plug that in. Color here. Don't need that. Okay, wrong direction for what I'm thinking. So let's get lines on the Y axis. Does that work? Yes. Then if I distort them a fair bit too much, then I want to kind of rotate them. Vector rotate. Let's put it on the right kind of axis. Oh, that looks interesting. Kind of like going from back to front. Like a, what's it called? Like a topological map. And we can reduce the scale as well. Oh, let's do that. I kind of like that. Okay, so now to make it gold, obviously we want metallic quite up high. Let's go for something a bit orange yellowy, a bit too yellow. Roughness down. Oh, there we go. Maybe a little bit higher on the roughness. Happens if I add a bit of a coat value as well to get some detail, maybe along the edge. Okay, well, I think that looks cool as it is. How long did that take? And we have all of our parameterized values to play around. Uh, let's take a variation of this, put it on another one. So, scrap splat nodes one, duplicate it, quote number three, because I've already got a two somewhere, and then change the color to something else. Let's do like a red and a silver, maybe? Yeah, not too bad. Something a bit more maroon. All right, just messing around. The point of this video, like I said, is just to say, you know, I told people in some previous comments that I would play around and actually use the hex scatter tools on something a bit more complicated. A bit more like a real use case. So this is your demonstration. I hope you are satisfied. Feel free to pick up the tool if you find it interesting. I'll be sure to use it for more stuff in the future. But since I didn't really do much of a breakdown about the tools, then feel free to check out the previous videos on the subject because they are much more in-depth. I'd actually recommend watching the pre-release video, the one that was more experimental, because I think I go into more depth in that one than the actual release video, because it was more about the theory and the reasoning and kind of how we're working towards it. So if you made it this far through the video, then feel free to put some kind of clay, brick related emoji, or even the unicorn one because that's our default one in the YouTube comments so I can see who made it this far. And when you subscribe, make sure to enable all on the bell setting so you can get notified of future content. And check out everything else. I've got stuff for you everywhere. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and I will see you next time.